Well, thank you all. It's, it's very good to be with you here today. And thank you to Javier Sanz, to Antonio Alut, to the Campus Domar. I don't know Gallego yet, but I, I, I'm beginning to appreciate it. Uh, and to the university, to the UNESCO chair for bringing me here to spend some time with you. I'm especially looking forward to this afternoon where it will be a dialogue, I hope, not just a one-way communication. So my theme today is what to me is really at the heart of all forms of integrated management or integrated governance. And that is meaningful participation of those who are involved. And the reason that we need participation is that all around the world we see many very good technically laws, regulations, plans, and so on. Many of which are not implemented or are implemented rather poorly. I believe that the reason for that is that those who are to be affected by such plans, have not participated, have not, do not feel any ownership for those plans, programs, and policies. And that therefore, these words of compliance and enforcement become important. Let me just take a minute as to what those terms mean. Uh, as you heard from Javier, we drove from Cadiz up here to A Coruña on Saturday, and we're good people, so we complied with the rules. When we saw the sign saying 120 kilometers an hour, we would go at 120 kilometers an hour. When we came into a tunnel and it said 90, we would slow down and we would go 90. That's because we believe that these rules are good rules and that we should obey them. And our desire is to obey them. If for some reason we decided, no, no, we're in a hurry and we're going to go faster, and if that was heard or seen by a policeman, then we would have enforcement. And he might stop it, stop us and say, you must pay a fine, you must pay it now, you must slow down. If you don't, we'll take away your license. There will be a punishment. You'll go to the courts. And even though you're a lawyer, you'll still have to pay. <laughs> that is enforcement. I think that the balance between participation, compliance, voluntary compliance, and enforcement is at the heart of what we are learning about the practice of integrated management, or what's now called the ecosystem approach. Vamos a ver. One more. As you've heard from Javier, I've been working in this field for a long time. Um, and I think that we are learning. Sometimes not as quickly as I wish we would learn, but we are learning. And this is one of the latest really simplifying graphics of what is all this about? What, what is it that we are trying to do? We're learning that what we have to do at a time when our species really dominates this planet and is now the major force of change in what's been called the Anthropocene, this period in our history, can be simplified down to saying there's an environmental domain on the right, there's the societal domain, us, on the other side, that what comes in between is the flow of goods and services from nature, which is our lifeblood, without them we die, and the rules by which we structure the relationship between those two domains is governance, governance of 
socio-economic environmental systems. <coughs> Whoops, I will learn. I think that one of the major points that we are learning, again, not learning quite as quickly as we, I wish we would, is that the dynamics of the practice is that one needs to integrate two very different ways of thinking, two very different expressions of human knowledge. That on the right, one can call it, as we understand and study nature, the environment, one can call it reliable knowledge. I don't call it scientific knowledge because some of the reliable knowledge is traditional knowledge that if you can show is true knowledge, not just prejudice, it is just as valid as scientific knowledge. But on this side, on the left, we have a way of thinking that we call the scientific way of thinking, which is terribly important. I was educated as a natural scientist. But the other side is the human side. And there, it's not as simple. It's about values. It's about perceptions of justice, of equity, of fairness, of political needs, of bargaining and accommodation. It's not simply cause, effect, science, truth, action. No, it's much more of a complex intermingling of different kinds of knowledge and ideas. I can't quite see this. I don't know if you can. C could we turn off this light? I, I don't know. My, my point here is that if the other slide didn't make it clear, it's very, very complex. We are working in, in coastal management, in marine management, in areas of great uncertainty, of great complexity. And therefore, what we do and how we do it must recognize that basic reality. Let's see if I learn. Oh, here we go with all the various. I'm, I'm not going to dig into this. I'm just going to show that. But this in itself, we could spend half an hour just talking about this graphic. Um, as certainty is either greater or less from sciences and technology, and as agreement on what to do and how to do it varies from good agreement to no agreement, you get into this zone of complexity over there on the right, zones of what in the US we call wicked problems, really horribly difficult, complicated problems rather like climate change. Um, and then you have chaos way over there to the right. In the management of coastal and marine ecosystems, we're mostly in the zone of complexity. Now, definitions are important, and I've come to believe that this work that we are all learning how to do is really about governance. For many years of my life, we talked about it as management. Um, management implies that you know what the goals are. We manage a war, we manage a school, we manage a country, we manage a business. Governance is really about, wait a minute, what really is our goal? And if our goal is sustainable development, and sustainable development is completely different from the direction we are currently going, collectively, as people on this planet, then you're in radical territory as well as very complex territory. This is a simple definition of ecosystem governance, which combines those two sides I was suggesting, in that it is both the formal and the informal agreements the institutions and the mores, the what people believe is right or wrong, um, not just law. Law, yes, but not mm -hmm. only law. 
that influence basically the rules of the game. How resources are utilized, how problems and opportunities are valued and analyzed. That's where participation comes in. It's just not for technical people to do that. What behavior is acceptable or, for, or forbidden? And remember, that isn't just by enforcement, but by compliance, because people believe in it. And what, what happens if you do not follow the rules? And in this talk, I'm going to go into a little detail on that. Um, and so I better keep moving here. One of the... Um, Key questions, I think, when you're in governance and working in some specific place is to recognize that there are three principal sources of governance. Governance is not government. Government is one source of governance and a very, very important one, but not the only one. My many years of working in Ecuador taught me that you have to learn how to manage situations where government is very weak, has very little power. You can't just say, oh well, can't do anything here. You, you have to work with the other sources of governance as well as government, and they are markets and civil society, which function with very different tools. I think that coastal and marine governance, the practice is teaching us, you have to involve all three. You have to, if you're really going to see change come about. And if what you are doing is not about change, then why do it? If there are coastal places with no problems, no need to change, you don't need integrated coastal management, you don't need coastal governance, everything's fine. Mm -hmm. But if there are problems, then you have to really think about these three different sources. And I find this very useful. You have to get out of the box of thinking it's all about govern government. No. And often government can't do that much. I am totally convinced that this practice is primarily about learning. Learning, meaning it is a continuing process of learning. Again, if the goal is sustainable forms of development, and we are going very quickly to more and more unsustainable forms of development, we have a great deal to learn. And this simple cycle I have found very useful because it is so simple in a very complex undertaking. And it's based on learning. This is a version of the learning cycle. Step one, what are the problems? What are the goals? Where are we working? Step two, what are we going to do? What's the plan? What is it feasible to do? Step three, can we get formal endorsement, government, but also whoever has the power? Sometimes it's not just government. Can we get the authority? Can we get the money, the resources, to actually implement something? Step four. Step five, what are we learning? What has changed? What must the adaptation be for the next loop? In Ecuador, for example, to complete one loop at the national scale took 20 years. In Rhode Island, we've now been working hard for 40 years, and we're in our third generation in a very stable country with systems that work better than the systems in a place like Ecuador. The big problem that we face, and why we're going to talk a bit more about enforcement and compliance, and we see this everywhere, including in Spain, including in Galicia, 
is there's a gap between step three and step four. Lots of plans of normativa, of uh, English, of norms, of regulations, and so on, that aren't, aren't being implemented or aren't being implemented long enough. We have lots and lots of lots of short-term projects, studies and efforts of various kinds, but not a continuity of effort where learning is the main theme. I keep going the wrong way. Mm -hmm. So the implementation gap, as I just said, is where those first three steps, issue analysis, planning, and governmental mandates, do not bring about the changes in behavior that are necessary. In other words, people keep building in the zona publica, or the fishermen keep fishing for fish that are too small, or the boats are too big, or whatever, working in other people's uh, fishing grounds. And therefore, the, the reasons for doing integrated management or governance aren't there. You've just spent a lot of money, done a lot of thinking, a lot of talking, a lot of arguing, but there's really no result. So no, the, the key thing is to make the bridge from step three to step four, and that's where we keep failing and falling down. We lament all the time that the reason that there is this implementation gap is that constituencies, people who believe in what the plan or the policy or the rule, remember the definition of governance, um, there, there, there aren't and sufficient people who believe in this. It's seen as an unimportant or technical exercise. And therefore, there's no political will. And we love to say, oh, the problem is those horrible politicians. They just don't <laughs> care. They don't listen to us. They, they're confused. <laughs> yes, but the reason of that is that there isn't a support within civil society, business interests, and so on for whatever that plan or program is. We tend to emphasize the technical rather than things that really people care about, which is justice, equity, transparency. That's what motivates people. I've, in my life, had thousands of public meetings, often with very angry people. Mm -hmm. And it's about justice. It's about equity. It's about why did this happen to me, and I know it was wrong. That's what a lot of this is really all about. But as we all collectively learn, we tend to want to make this more objective, more technical. And a huge problem is that so much of this work is funded as isolated, short-term projects. What we need is sustained, long-term programs that really matter to people because they are addressing issues, problems and opportunities that people care about. Another huge problem, of course, is that in so many places, even if you get through step three, even if you have a constituency and you have the program that's been formally adopted, there just isn't the funding. It all falls back and people say, oh well, do it. Great. Congratulations. No. We don't say we've learned the technology of how to build roads and then just say, go, build the road. No, of course not. We fund our educational systems, our health systems. We have to fund these other systems as well. And currently we don't do that. So crucial to getting over this implementation gap, I and the people who I work with have concluded is this business of building a constituency. And a constituency doesn't translate very well into different languages. 
we have a hard time in Spanish. In other languages, it's even harder. In English, traditionally, a constituency is the group of people who vote for a politician or a political program. And they go out and demonstrate, and often they give money, and then they vote. They really care. What we need in meaningful coastal and marine governance programs are constituencies, not for a person, but for an idea, for a program. And programs that have constituencies will create political will, and they will move forward. Really, the practice, I've come to believe, is a social process. Very important that it has good technical and scientific inputs, but above all, it is a social process. A constituency is a social phenomena. So, let's go to participation. And just so you know that I'm a practical person and I don't live in some dream world, um, when I started in this work long ago, when I was a young person like some who I see here, uh, the idea of participation in the United States was a new idea that was inserted into the Federal Coastal Zone Management Act of 1972, which was a very creative and interesting piece of legislation <coughs> that I don't have time to go into, but it did some quite extraordinary things. It said the United States is a federal system, a federal government. It said the greatest natural resource that we have in the United States is our coast and its resources. Big statement. Coasts are number one. Two, state and local governments cannot and will not do the work that needs to be done to manage those resources well and for the future. They are too involved in the local politics, problems, desires, pressures, and so on. Therefore, the federal government puts forward a set of policies and standards, but it's a voluntary program because the federal government cannot impose this on the states. So why would the states comply? Because the program offers incentives, and that's something that I see in very few countries, is incentives for this kind of thinking, this kind of work. So in the US, if a state met the standards, and the standards are rigorous, you got some money for planning, supposedly for only two years. In many cases, it became obvious it needed four. Florida needed eight. And then more money to assist in the implementation. And then something called another very clever idea called the constitu the consistency clause, where the federal government must behave in a manner that is consistent with the state policies and program. Okay, I didn't mean to go into all of that, but the idea of participation at the beginning, because the law had very strong requirements for participation, and I remember very well, particularly people in government, saying, this is stupid. This is a waste of time. Why, why, why do we have to participate? And in many countries, you hear this quite loudly. It continues. In the US, too, in some cases. Though there, it really has become part of the culture. But the view is, about participation being a waste of time, is that it's not necessary. I'm the agency. I know. I have the responsibility. Why do we need all these other people who don't know, who argue, who have crazy ideas, who... Why? 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 And very importantly, if you really have participation, 
It means that you have to share power. If you are a governmental agency and you have an authority, you, you, it's against human nature, unfortunately, to share it. But participation requires different degrees of the sharing of that power. And it can be seen, and is indeed the case, but I'll get to this in a minute, it's a generator, it can be a generator of conflicts. Indeed, I think back to public workshops and meetings and smaller meetings between people in conflict, it's, there's a lot of conflict, but a good participation process brings out that conflict and lets it be resolved, doesn't keep it hidden behind, and that is good. Okay, whoops. The other view is, the view that I have come to believe in and many others, is that participation is good and is at the heart of governance because it uncovers conflicts, it provides for transparency and accountability. Those are big and important words. It generates knowledge. It brings to light things that otherwise wouldn't be done. Above all, it is the path to building a constituency and that wonderful and strange commodity that's at the very center again of this practice, which is trust. That different parties come to believe and respect in each other and hear each other. Trust cannot be bought. It can only be won. And winning it takes time, takes effort, takes a set of values that often are not present in our existing systems. So, the work of steps one, step two, step three, to get over the, the chasm, the hole of the implementation gap, needs to be about building a constituency. And the other key point about a constituency and participation is that it has to be about things that matter to people. I have come to advocate very passionately for forms of ecosystem governance that are issue driven. An issue is a problem. It can also be an opportunity. Issues create interdisciplinary, interinstitutional collaboration. If you have an issue of poor water quality, that is going to draw in people concerned about habitats, people concerned about aesthetics, people concerned about economics, about all sorts of things because it's an issue. An issue is not a sector. An issue is a problem or an opportunity. And if one builds these kinds of programs around problems and opportunities that matter. A friend of mine who for many years led the Chesapeake Bay program, a very big program in the US, said issues must stir the blood, get people excited and interested. That's what is on the way if you do it well, and it's risky, it's difficult <laughs> um, to building a constituency. Okay, I should have waited and put up the slide first. So here's a definition of issues. I think that one of the other things that we need to learn is that issues change from place to place. The issues in Galicia may be similar, but are not the same as the issues in Andalusia. And they're going to be different from the issues in Rhode Island, or Ghana, or Australia, or Norway. And they are driven by their context, by understanding those two sides of the science and the society. And so the, the 
art and the science of this practice is about placing issues in their context. Because to almost contradict what I just said, actually the issues that we face along coastlines are about the same six issues everywhere. But how they express themselves and what can be done about them changes dramatically from one place to another. And it's all about understanding that context and understanding what is doable at a given place at a given time. It's useful to divide issues into three baskets. And in integrated management, you have to keep looking across those different baskets and integrating. There are the environmental issues, of course. There are the social issues, of course. Many of the countries that I work, a lot of poverty. It's a major social issue, which is going to affect everything else. And then the governance issues themselves. And I think that when one is working in a given place, thinking in terms of those three columns and what are the interrelationships in the zone of complexity where these things play out. Um, these are the three. Not just one, but all three. I, I've spent a lot of time trying to codify what I think we are learning about these things. And most recently, I and a group of other people prepared a, a handbook that if you find these ideas potentially useful or interesting, it's on the web, on LOIX. Um, and it's a whole methodology, which I can't get into here, but that lays out a process of thinking and analyzing in this way. So, now let's switch horses a little bit and dig down on how does this play out in terms of, we've talked a lot about, I've talked a lot, maybe too much about participation and constituencies. Well, what does this mean in terms of enforcement? And there's been a lot of very, very interesting and useful research on this topic. And it shows that the chances of enforcement of actually, where necessary, imposing, and the only one who should impose is government, imposing a set of rules, is that the policy or the plan is viewed as legitimate and it's viewed as fair. In negotiation amongst groups of people in conflict, I learned long ago that the bottom line is, is the solution fair? Is the fisherman and the rich person living on the coast, do they end up saying, okay, I don't like it, but it's fair? Then you say, okay, we can probably move ahead now if they see it as fair. That people understand and support the purposes of what one is doing. We will talk this afternoon, for example, about Ghana, where there are all kinds of rules on fisheries. The big problem is the fishermen don't understand why have these rules been prepared, and they didn't participate in preparing them. It's going to be very difficult to enforce those rules. The necessary money and the legal basis is in place. The rules are enforced in an even-handed manner, and the sanctions are appropriate. I mean, if we were driving our car from Cadiz to uh, A Coruña, and you were stopped by going 120 instead of 90, 50 or 100 euros, said, no, you're going to prison for three years, you'd say, hey, well, come on, that's not, that, that's not an appropriate sanction. And sanctions are, there's a whole, Jane Lubchenco and uh, uh, who's the other woman who just won the prize? Um, the woman who just won the, the Nobel Prize? Uh, um, uh, Eleanor Ostrom. Ostrom. 
Eleanor Ostrom has written wonderful things about the need to have graduated sanctions. You break the rules once, 50 euros. You break it twice, ah, now this is getting serious. You break it three times, you're out. And having, thinking about things in that graduated way is, is enormously important. Why do people break the rules? If we're concerned about this gap between step three and step four, the implementation gap, why do people break the rules? Well, I think we know the answer, due again to much research by many people. And that is that it's worth it. The illegal gain is, is high. Well, no, these, I need to phrase that differently. The four factors are how big is the illegal gain? What is the size of the penalty? Very interestingly, a major reason for breaking or not breaking the rules is whether the person feels it's the right thing to do. It is about their sense of appropriate behavior and justice. And many people thought that was a romantic idea, but research has shown that no, that really, really matters to people. We're very social animals. And the last one, social influence, comes out of that same corner, that if your peers, the people you live with, the people of whom you are part of their society, said, you shouldn't have done that, and I'm no longer your friend, you're out. Because you did that, that is crucial to a decision of should I break the rules or should I live by the rules. I'm looking at Antonio, who really <laughs> struggles with these things with the cofradias and so on. It's a, it's, it's, it's a very major issue. So compliance, voluntary compliance, is low when the profits are high. The punishments are few or unlikely. Enforcement is ineffective. The consequences don't really matter very much. And everybody says, why should I obey the rules? Nobody else is. I look stupid if I do that. And in many countries, including the United States, Rhode Island is known as one of the most corrupt states in the United States. Our history of fishing, our history of water pollution has been terrible examples of corruption and not following the rules. So this isn't only countries like Ecuador or wherever, fishing in the high seas. These are very real problems that exist everywhere. And understanding these dynamics is really crucial. For those of you who are going to be here in the afternoon, these are the conditions currently in the place where I'll be going back to in two weeks, trying to work with people there on rethinking rules so that we have a hope of compliance. And it's difficult. It's difficult, but it's necessary. We're also learning that another aspect of all of this is that the way enforcement takes place is very, very important. If we had been stopped coming back and the policeman, when you roll down the window, says, good evening, sir, may I have your license? It's not a gun, give me your license, which happens in some places. It's courtesy, fair-handed dealing is very, very, very important. And in many of the countries that I have worked, that's not how things work. And it is a major contributor to the gap in implementation. Since some of my colleagues here are lawyers, another real problem is judges. Judges may be used to dealing with fraud, domestic violence, and so on, you bring in somebody and said, he broke the fishing rule, and they say, what does that matter? So 
and, and he built a, a house in a place that's supposed to be in the, in the public zone. Wow. Mm -hmm. So you have to really often work hard with judges to make them part of the constituency for the program. People who understand and believe this is important. And when it comes my turn as judge to act on this, I'm going to do so in an informed manner. Oh, that was it. <laughs> so, okay, and I think I've stayed on time, which is rare for me when I get excited about these things. In summary, I would say that the practice and the conceptual frameworks for the management of socio-economic, socio-environmental systems, the, 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 the practice of integrated coastal management, of marine spatial planning, all those various expressions of that integrated way of thinking is above all a social process, informed by science, strengthened by technology, but it's above all a social process. It must address issues that matter to the people of the place. Meaningful and sustained participation builds those constituencies and then political will. Compliance is high when the rules are seen as fair and equitable. And the way enforcement is acted out, the way it is implemented, is also a very, very important part of bringing about the kinds of changes in behavior that we collectively need if we're going to start moving more in the direction of sustainable forms of coastal and marine use rather than increasingly unsustainable forms. Thank you very much. <laughs>